I mean, I would consider all of the options there before you start, start trying to get people to like you. It's really easy to fall into that trap, you know, but you have to really think about, do you really like them? Is that somebody that you really want to spend a lot of time with? Do you really want to watch football every single week just to have something to talk about with this person? Because they're going to think that you like football and then you're going to have to do it forever. And you might feel like it's torture to do that. And then eventually, maybe six months down the road, maybe a year or two years or five years, you're going to realize you don't want to watch football anymore. And they're not going to know who you are as a person because you've told them that you like football or you've told them that you like the Kardashians or you've told them that you like shopping when you really don't. And so it's almost like you create this whole other persona of yourself just to fit in with what this person likes. And then when you finally give up the ruse of like, you know what? I don't really like football. I don't really like shopping. I don't really like the Kardashians you're not gonna have anything in common with them. I believe the biggest problem in the world is that people don't understand themselves enough. This show is designed to help you understand your INFJ personality, heal from your past, and create a life that you love. I'm Sarah Kuhn, and this is The Quiet Ones Podcast. So this week on the podcast, I am going to answer your questions. I've been collecting questions for a while. I've asked a couple of times on Instagram. Um, and then every time I see like somebody ask a question, I take a screenshot of it. Um, and I keep meaning to do like an Instagram live or something and it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so we're just gonna go through all of your questions today and um, answer as many as I possibly can. Okay, and I try to organize them in a way that makes sense. So um, we're gonna talk about what INFJs stand for, um, how to know if you're an INFJ, some of our different behaviors. Um, we're gonna talk about anxiety and mindsets, then how to make friends, then INFJs in relationships. And then we're going to end with um, finding your purpose and um, what INFJs are like at work. And then we're going to talk about um, being a highly sensitive person as well. All right, so let's get started. The first question is, what does INFJ stand for? I get this question a lot. Um, the best place that you can find an answer, if you want to read along with what I'm going to tell you, is on my website, which is infjwoman.com slash INFJ. Um, that will tell you every single thing that you want to know about being an INFJ. So basically INFJ is a term that comes from the Myers-Briggs type indicator personality test. It's based on their theory that everyone in the world falls into one of 16 different personality types. And those personality types are made up of four different categories. So you're either an introvert or an extrovert. You either are intuition or sensing, you're either feeling or thinking, and you're either judging or perceiving. So for INFJs, we are um, introverted, we have intuition, we're feeling, and we're judging. So let's go through just real, really quickly what those things mean. Um, being an introvert means that um, you gain energy by being by yourself, and um, you lose energy or you expend energy by being around other people. Um, some people mistake being an introverted for being quiet and being extroverted for being outgoing. That's not always the case. You can be an outgoing person and be introverted. It just means that you lose energy when you're around other people. And so you need to spend time alone or to spend time with one or two people who are extremely close to you so that you can feel recharged. Um, so you, ca you can be shy and be an introvert. A lot of us are. I I'm shy when I first meet people. Um, I was very shy when I was smaller and I've sort of become a little bit more outgoing <laughs> as I've grown up. Um, another thing that um, affects whether you're shy or more outgoing is anxiety. I have um, a social anxiety disorder. Um, most of my anxiety is focused around social situations, meeting new people. The more people that there are, the more anxious that I get. So. 
obviously it's more difficult for me to talk to a lot of people than it is for me to talk to one or two people. Um, so that plays a role too in, you know, whether you are shy or outgoing, not so much whether you're introverted or extroverted. Introverted and extroverted really just depends on where you gain your energy from. Um, there is such a thing as being an ambivert, which is being introverted sometimes and extroverted sometimes. It's important to remember that each one of these four categories, nobody is 100% introverted or 100% extroverted. There's kind of a spectrum of where you're at. And you can take um, a personality test at 16personalities.com, which will give you, um, they give you a percentage of how introverted and how extroverted that you are. And I was gonna pull up mine real quick here so I can tell you what mine is. The last time that I took the test, I came out 93% introverted, which is pretty high, <laughs> it's pretty high. Most people will fall you know, somewhere in the middle. And if you're close to like 50%, then that's where you come up with like being, um, being an ambivert. So sometimes you feel introverted and sometimes you feel extroverted. Okay, so the next one is whether you are um, intuitive or sensing. Intuition means that you know things about people. You take in a lot of information um, that maybe they're not necessarily telling you, but you take in all this information and you just get a feeling about people. If you know what I'm talking about, if that makes sense to you, then you definitely have intuition. Sometimes it almost feels like you're psychic, but it's not quite that level. Um, if you're sensing, then you take in information through your five senses and you stick to that specific information. You don't really read more into the information. You just take in what you can see and what you can feel. You're more focused on what people are actually telling you than reading between the lines. Um, the last time I took the Myers-Briggs test, I was 94% intuitive. So again, you know, that's pretty high on intuition. Okay, the next one is you're either thinking or feeling. So this is how you make big decisions in your life. Um, if you have a thinking personality, you look at facts and logic, you look at reason and rationale and what's the most logical thing to do, right? If you have a feeling personality, you make decisions based on your gut feeling, um, almost based on your intuition as well. You take that into, um, into account and you say, okay, what feels like the right thing to do? Maybe you look at the facts and logic as well, because INFJs do consider um, facts and logic, but when it comes down to making a big decision, we don't necessarily stick to facts and logic. We stick to how we feel. In the end, we're going to go with, does this feel like the right thing to do? When I moved to Boston, I was living in the Midwest, and I was looking at moving to several different cities, and Boston has a very high cost of living, one of the highest um, cost of rent in the United States. It's usually second or third. Um, there's tons of traffic, so lots of people here. You know, there was just a whole list of things that was like, this is not a good idea. And when it came down to it, I was like, it just feels like the right thing to do. And I can usually tell people who are, have a thinking personality versus a feeling personality, because when I say it just feels like the right thing to do, like it felt like I knew it was what I was supposed to do. People who are feelers are like, yeah, I understand that. I've made big decisions like that before. And people who have a thinking personality are like, that doesn't make any sense. Like you're totally crazy. Why wouldn't you go with, with what was most logical? Um, so if you have a feeling personality, you've probably made big decisions that are like, I don't know why, it just feels like the right thing to do. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make logical sense, but I just know this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, my test came out 81% feeling. Um, and like I said, INFJs are one of the rare personality types where we consider facts and logic and feeling. Uh, but generally, when we're talking about big decisions, we'll go with our feeling, with our gut feeling, um, and with our intuition. Okay, so then the last one is either judging or perceiving. Um, 16 personalities calls it prospecting. Judging doesn't mean that you are judgmental, so make sure that you don't get that 
um, mistaken, it's not a negative thing. It's really just how you make decisions and how your life is organized. So people who have a judging personality are very planned and orderly. We like to have things figured out. We like to consider all the options, but then we wanna narrow it down to one thing. Um, we're also very focused and driven on that one thing, right? Cause we know exactly what we want and we're gonna go get it. Um, we're generally more, more organized. So our life isn't really messy on the outside. Our desk is gonna be organized. Our room or our house is, is probably pretty organized most of the time. Um, people who are perceiving are, they tend to be a little bit messier. Um, they like to keep their options open. They don't want to have things narrowed down to one thing. They want to have all of the options. Um, they tend to have a little bit more trouble focusing, but then they also have a lot more ideas um, and they're a lot more creative. When I took the test, I was 65% judging. So I'm a little bit closer to the middle um, on judging versus perceiving. And sometimes I question whether I'm an INFP versus an INFJ. So when I took the test and it came up 65% judging, I was like, okay, that makes sense. That means that 65% of the time I'm using the judging function. And then there's still like 35% of the time where I lean more towards perceiving to where, you know, there are times when I like to keep my options open or I wanna play around with ideas. Um, but then ultimately I usually narrow it down to one thing. Um, the 16 personality types website adds one more thing, which sometimes you'll see people talk about being an INFJ dash T or an INFJ dash A. Um, this is really more how confident and you are in your abilities and your decisions. So the A means assertive and the T means turbulent. Um, my test came up 72% turbulent, <laughs> which didn't surprise me at all because there's a lot in my life that feels like it's um, turbulent. I'm more anxious, more undecided about things, about some things. Um, there's been, there's definitely been a lot of, a lot of turbulence in my life. So that, that kind of made sense to me. Okay, so the next question. Are we born this way as INFJs or do life's experiences shape it? There are a lot of different theories about whether you're born an INFJ or you're born with your Myers-Briggs personality type. Some people say yes, some people say no. I, I believe that you are born with your personality type. Um, the people, Isabella Myers and Catherine Briggs, who, who set up the Myers-Briggs type indicator, they used the work of Carl Jung to shape their test. And Carl Jung was, you know, one of the fathers of modern day psychology. And he believed that you're born with your personality type. So for me, I kind of go with what he says, which is that you're born with your personality type. I do believe that there are influences in your life that change how you perceive some things, change how you react to certain things. Obviously not all INFJs are born in the same place. You know, we all have different experiences in life. We're born in different countries and different cities in the same country. And even if you grow up on a different side of town from somebody else, you're gonna have a different experience, right? We go to different schools and we have different families and we grow up with different influences. Um, we have different traumas that we go through and all of that affects us. Um, but ultimately, I believe that you're born with your personality the way that it is and that it doesn't change. Some people think that your personality changes over time, but I don't believe that it does. There are things that you can improve on. There are things that get better or worse in your life. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I was extremely shy when I was young. Like when I was really young, I used to hide behind my mom's skirt <laughs> when people would talk to me or when they would try to talk to me I would hide behind her like I don't want to talk to you um and I had an older sister who would always talk for me she was very loud and outgoing and she loved talking to people and so she was always the talkative one and I would just hide and be quiet but then as we grew up and got older 
she wasn't always there. And, you know, when I went to school, she was two years older than I was. And so I had to learn how to speak for myself. And then as I grew up even more, when I went to college, I moved away from my family. And now I live 1500 miles away from my family. And so I guess I almost want to say like, I don't have the luxury of being so shy anymore. <laughs> like there are times when I have to go talk to people. And so I have to push myself to go and talk to people. And that has helped me, I guess, to, to be a little bit more outgoing. Um, so some of it, you know, it comes from things that, that just have to change as you get older. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that I like to be by myself. That's how I recharge. Um, I don't recharge by being around people. That, that hasn't changed. Okay, the next question. How is INFJ the rarest um, of all the Myers-Briggs types, yet everyone I find is INFJ? Does the 1% to 3% of the population estimate seem accurate to you? Um, this one is a little bit difficult. I don't know that INFJs are the rarest. There are some people, some websites who say we're the rarest. Others say that we're one of the rarest. I've read that women who are INFJs are the rarest. Um, I don't know specifically if we are the rarest. I think that the one to 3% of the population estimate, I think that seems very accurate to me. A lot of people want to be INFJs. INFJs are talked about and perceived as being, you know, super rare, which everybody wants to be rare, right? Everybody wants to be super special. Um, but I've also read that INFJs are also the most interested in the, in personality types in, you know, the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. So if all INFJs or most INFJs are interested in personality types, and you find a lot of information about personality types online, then doesn't that make sense that, that there would be more INFJs who are talking about being INFJ? So that's one of my arguments. The other argument is that a lot of people want to be INFJ and not all of them are. And I mean, I think that that's true. I don't think that we should be attacking people about whether they're actually a real INFJ or not, because I think that that's up to each person to to figure out for themselves. And, you know, since I started my Instagram account, my blog and my podcast, a lot of people um, criticize me about whether I'm an INFJ or not. Um, people have said that I can't be an INFJ because I have a podcast. And <laughs> to me, that's like a really crazy thing to say. First of all, like they don't know me. So why would they judge me as to whether I'm an you know, an INFJ or not, they don't know my personality type. Just because I have a podcast doesn't mean that I'm not an INFJ. Um, some people who are INFJs like to hide from the world and that's totally fine. Others of us, like me, I like to push myself to do things that are out of my comfort zone. I feel like that helps me to grow and to be a better person and to learn more things. Um, so saying that just because, you know, you have a podcast or YouTube channel that you're not an, I, um, an INFJ, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. There's another trend that I've noticed over the last couple of years, which brings us to the next question. <laughs> if we go by letters, I'm an INFJ, but by cognitive functions, I'm an INFP. So what am I? So just in case you don't know what cognitive functions are, Cognitive functions come from the work of Carl Jung. He believed in cognitive functions and he defined them. So then came along Isabella Myers and then Catherine Briggs and they set up the um, Myers-Briggs type indicator personality test. The Myers-Briggs test uses what are called preferences to type people, okay? So the letters INFJ, those are preferences. Some people talk about cognitive functions because they have been um, sorted out to where you can connect a preference to a function. There's a trend going around that people are typing themselves based on cognitive functions rather than by preferences. So when you do that, it's very, very easy to get confused as to what type that you are. 
So, you know, being an INFJ versus being an ENFP, those are pretty big differences, right? I type people based on preferences because that's how the Myers-Briggs test types people based on preferences, not based on functions. You can type people based on functions. You can type yourself based on functions as well if you want to. Um, that's completely up to you. But when I help people figure out what type they are, I use preferences. And, you know, that's the way that the Myers-Briggs test types people. So that's the way that I prefer to do it. I feel like you get the most accurate answer by typing yourself and other people by preferences rather than functions. I think that that's why a lot of people are confused about what their types are. That's why there's a lot of people who think that they're INFJs and they're not really INFJs. It's a lot more straightforward when you're typing people by preferences rather than by functions. Okay, so the next question is, how do I know for sure that I'm an INFJ? Well, first of all, I suggest that you take um, the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. There are multiple places where you can take it. I like taking it on 16personalities.com because it's free. Also, they give you the, um, the percentages of you know how, how much of an introvert are you versus an extrovert. Um, and I feel like that helps a lot. I also think that once you've taken the test, regardless of which outcome that you get, that you should go read the definition of what each one of those things mean. And you can find the definitions of what each one of the letters means on the Myers-Briggs website, which is myersbriggs.org. And I will link that in the show notes so you can find the link pretty quickly. Especially like if you take the test on the 16 personalities website and it tells you um, the percentages that you are, if you come up, you know, 95% introvert, it's pretty pretty definitive that you're an introvert, right? But if you come up like I did with, you know, like 65% judging versus perceiving, or maybe you come up with like 50% judging or 55% judging, that would be one of the cases where I would say, okay, go read the description of being, of having a judging personality type and the description of having a perceiving personality type and think about which ones you do most of the time. It's really easy in that situation to say, this is how I want to be rather than this is how I actually am. I was mistyped for a while because when I took the test, I answered the questions how I wanted to be rather than how I am most of the time. And what helped me is I was talking to my niece about our personality types um, she became obsessed with, with Myers-Briggs as much as I was, and we were talking about different situations, and she had a situation where she um, got into an argument with her grandma, and she was, you know, we were talking about it, and she was like, I just don't understand, like, why does grandma always act like this? I don't understand what I did wrong. She's like, how do I fix this? How do I not have these issues? And so we were talking through what happened, and I said, well, it doesn't matter the facts and logic because my niece has a thinking personality type. And so she's looking at the facts and logic of the situation. And I said to her, you know, it doesn't matter the facts and logic. It doesn't matter if you were factually correct, because what happened is you hurt your grandma's feelings. And so you focusing on the facts is really the problem because you hurt her feelings and she's more concerned about how she feels about it than what's actually factually correct. She was upset about how you approach the situation rather than what the facts were. And um, <laughs> through that conversation, my niece was like, I don't think you are a thinking personality type. I think you're a feeling personality type. And I was so like upset and offended when she said that because I didn't want to have a feeling personality type. I thought that meant that you were one of those like crazy people who would just fly off the handle and get angry about things. And, you know, you would cry all the time and throw big fits. And that, and that wasn't me. You know, I have big feelings, but I, I hide them from people. I like to keep them inside. I don't want to show my emotions to other people. So I thought, no, there's no way that that can be right. I don't have a feeling personality type. I've never been that way. So then I started reading about what having a feeling personality type meant and I realized that just because you have a feeling personality type, it doesn't mean that you have 
you know, explosions of outward emotion, it means that you feel things very deeply and that you make decisions first on how you feel. And a lot of people who have feeling personality types don't show people their emotions. They are very stoic because, you know, we've been hurt by showing people how we feel, by telling people how we feel. And so we tend to keep it inside a lot. So sometimes you need an outside person to who knows you to look at what you do day to day and say, you know what? I know you want to be a thinking personality type, but you're really not. You really focus more on feelings. Um, sometimes that helps. Okay, so the next one is I am so torn between ISFJ or INFJ, both describe me. I just can't be sure of the N or the S. So the N stands for intuition and the S stands for sensing. So to get a really good answer for you, I'm going to go over to the myersbriggs.org website and we're going to read what it means to be either to have intuition or to have sensing. So this is how you collect information, basically. That's what um, this part of your personality is. And it says, do you prefer to focus on the basic information you take in, which is sensing, or do you prefer to interpret and add meaning? People who have intuition interpret um, information themselves. We read between the lines. So if you click on where it says sensing or intuition, it'll take you to a different page that has a lot more information. So under sensing, it says, the following statements generally apply to me. I remember events as snapshots of what actually happened. I solve problems by working through facts until I understand the problem. So more facts and logic base. I am pragmatic and I look at the bottom line. I start with facts and then form the big picture. I trust experience first. I trust words and symbols less. So you're trusting what you experienced through what you saw, what you felt, um, like fe felt with your actual hands, um, what you tasted, what you smelled, you know, what you can what you can know for sure is true based on you were there, you experienced it with your own um, eyes, you saw it with your own eyes, you know, you were able to feel it, it made sense to you logically because you were there. Uh, and the last one says, sometimes I pay so much attention to facts, either past or present, that I miss new possibilities. When you have intuition, it's a lot different. So for intuition, it says, I remember events by what I read between the lines about their meeting, about their meaning. I solve problems by leaping between different ideas and possibilities. I'm interested in doing things that are new and different. I like to see the big picture, then to find out the facts. I trust impressions, symbols, and metaphors more than what I actually experienced. Sometimes I think so much about new possibilities that I never look at how to make them a reality. So this one for me, I think a lot about when I meet new people. Um, I started a new job, well, gosh, it's been like three years ago. And I remember there were a couple specific people. I, I remember meeting them so clearly because the first time that I met one person, I thought to myself, I don't have a good feeling about this person. I don't know what it is. I don't have any facts and logic to back it up. I just don't have a good feeling. A lot of people talk about energy, right? That, you know, some people have different levels of energy. Some people have good energy. Some people have negative energy. And so, I mean, that's the best way that I can describe it. Like, I don't have any facts or logic to say this is not a good person or I should stay away from this person. I just have this feeling, this impression that, you know, I'm gathering all of this information that I don't even know where it's coming from. I'm just telling you that just like that, this is not a good person. I'm going to be careful around this person. And I've learned, you know, after 36 years of having these experiences, I've learned that you don't just go tell people, I don't like that person. Because they're going to say, well, you just met them. You spent 10 seconds with that person. How can you tell that they're not a good person, right? But I just know. Like, I can't tell you how, I don't have the facts. I will 
start looking for evidence of, you know, are they a good person? Are they not a good person? And 99 times out of 100, I'm spot on with what my intuition tells me. So then I met this other person and like within 10 seconds, I knew that we were going to be really good friends. And we ended up being very good friends. Um, that person is somebody that I talk to about everything. And we have discussions where we don't agree on a lot of things like politics. We don't agree on politics. We don't agree on things about the pandemic. Um, we've had some really deep and intense conversations, but at the end of the day, we both have this type of personality where we can say, okay, we can agree not to disagree and that's fine. Um, this person is also, they have a very different personality than I do. So I know that this person focuses on facts and logic and, and what they can see with their hands and with their eyes, and they don't believe in things that they can't see. Um, and so I know that, you know, you can't come to this person with like, with how you feel because that's not how they communicate. But, you know, when you're talking about, are you a sensing person or are you an intuitive person? I usually go to the Myers-Briggs website and I look at those things and I say, okay, what applies to me more? I don't start with facts and then form a big picture. I look at the big picture and then I start looking for facts. And every time I find a fact, I say, okay, does this fit in with what I think? Or does it change how I think? Um, or what I think is going to happen or what I think about um, a person, uh, the story that I've created about a person. Okay, so the next one says, I typed as an INFP most of my life, but only as an INFJ in the last year, and I'm 36 years old. Is this normal? It can be normal. Um, I typed as an INTJ for probably three or four years um, before I figured out that I was an INFJ. It can be normal. It doesn't mean that you've changed or that your personality type has changed. It means that maybe you were mistyped in the past, maybe you're mistyped now. Um, it really just depends, honestly. So I would go back to the, the Myers-Briggs website and look at the difference between judging and perceiving. So the basic definition is um, judging and perceiving is the structure of your life, right? So it says in dealing with the outside world, do you prefer to get things decided or do you prefer to stay open to new information and options? If you're more decided, you have a judging personality type. If you um, like options, then you have a perceiving personality type. I'll give you a real life example of this because it's, it's so blatantly obvious. <laughs> um, my niece has a perceiving personality type and I have a judging personality type. So even in little things like um, going into a restaurant, she, she doesn't know what she wants to eat, especially if it's a new restaurant. She wants to try everything on the menu, but you know we don't have that kind of money. So it's like, okay, pimp, and just pick one thing. And it's almost like an, existential, like an existential crisis asking her to pick one thing because she'll sit there and just go back and forth and back and forth. And she just doesn't know and she can't make a decision. And it turns into like this massive problem, right? For me, I look at the menu and I'm like, this is what I want. Like, I know exactly what I want. I probably knew what I wanted before we went to the restaurant. I probably looked at the menu before we went to the restaurant. Um, so I've learned like in order to deal with that, we have strategies now of like, okay, we're going to a new restaurant. So look at the menu ahead of time, two or three days ahead of time and try to narrow it down to like what, you know, what sounds the best. Uh, what's the most related to other things that you have tried in the past? Um, generally, her decision making is like that all the time. She doesn't know. And I've tried every single strategy to help her make a decision, right? I've tried like, let's make a pros and cons list. Let's, you know, think about the bigger picture and thinking about the bigger picture for her is like even that that's like the worst thing. <laughs> so I wouldn't go there because she generally doesn't know. Um, so, you know, you just try different things to try to make a decision and figure out which one works. There are times for me when I struggle with making a decision and generally it is bigger decisions. 
it's like, am I going to move across the country? Am I going to start a new career? You know, anything that's like really big and life-changing, those are the decisions that I struggle with. And I might even, you know, play around with different ideas for six months or a year, but ultimately I settle on one thing and stick to it. And I usually have that existential crisis feeling like nothing is ever going to be okay again until I make a decision. And then once I make a decision, then everything is fine. But I've noticed that the difference is I can make a decision and then stick to that decision. But my niece doesn't feel fine when she makes a decision. She questions that decision over and over and over and over again. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's like a real life example of are you perceiving or are you judging? You can feel like you have a perceiving personality type. Like I have, I've questioned that in the past, but I think about how I feel once I've made a decision. Does it make me feel trapped when I'm narrowed things down to just one thing? And it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel trapped. It makes me feel calm. It makes me feel like everything is okay again. And I've heard that people who have perceiving personality types, they feel really bad once they've narrowed it down. Like they have to have multiple options. Okay, so the next question. Do you believe in zodiac signs? Do you think that there is a specific zodiac sign for each personality type? Um, I have a video on YouTube about zodiac signs that I will link in the show notes. Um, the basic answer is I don't really believe in zodiac signs. And I also don't believe that there's a correlation between zodiac signs and personality types, because if there was, if there was a correlation, then most, if not all INFJs would have the same zodiac sign, right? But we don't. And if you look at the video that I have on YouTube, people have listed their zodiac sign along with their personality type in the comments. And there isn't a causation <laughs> that I see. It's not like there's one common or that most people have one zodiac sign. It's not, it's, you know, it's an even distribution among all of the zodiac signs. So to me, there's not, there's not a, a, um, a coordination between the two of them. Are INFJs confused in whatever decision they have to make, or is it just my problem? Um, I have been confused in big decisions. I think I would need more information from you to answer that question specifically. Um, I would wanna know how old that you are. I wanna know what decision that it is that you're trying to make and why you feel like you're confused about it. When I was in high school, I didn't wanna graduate high school and that was because I knew that I had to go to college or that I had to make a decision about my life. And I had no idea what that was. I genuinely believed that I would get married by the time I was 20 years old. And so for me, going to college was a waste of time because I wasn't going to work. <laughs> I didn't need to do that. I wanted to be a stay at home mom and I was going to get married and have a baby right away. And, you know, that was what I had decided would be my life. So when I was in high school, I didn't, I hadn't met somebody yet. And I didn't know how I was going to meet the love of my life and, you know, how it was all going to come together. But I just felt like that was what was going to happen. And so when I graduated high school, I hadn't met somebody and I felt like I was in this crisis of like, what am I going to do with my life? And so I ended up going to college because that was like the backup plan. And thank God that I did because... <laughs> Here I am um, 18 years later, and I still haven't met the love of my life. And, and as it turns out, I actually did have to work and, and I'm glad that I went to college. Um, but typically when you're younger, it's a lot more difficult to make decisions because especially if you're high school or college age, because people put this pressure on you that you have to make decisions that affect the rest of your life when you're very young. And even if you're 18 or 20 years old, you don't feel like you're young, but you really are. And people act like, you know, whatever your, your chosen career is, you're going to do that for the rest of your life. But that's not really accurate because most people don't, especially millennials. 
you know, we, I read a stat that says that millennials will have nine different careers in their lifetime. And that's not jobs, that's careers. That's totally different things that you're going to do. So, you know, I think that when you're young, if you're having a problem making a decision, that the problem is that there's too much pressure and not enough information. And there's this feeling of you have to do this one thing for the rest of your life. Um, and especially too, like when I went to college, I have $70,000 worth of student loans and, you know, there's a lot of pressure to pay that back and not really a lot of money, <laughs> right? You look at that student loan and you're like, oh, like, is my whole life going to be defined on whether or not I can pay that back? And what happens if I can't, am I going to jail? Like, you know, what happens? And so I feel like that's, that's a lot of why we can't make decisions or why we find it difficult to make decisions because there's just a lot of pressure and there isn't a lot of, you know, what do you want to do? What feels good? What feels right? It's more like what makes the most logical sense? What are you going to make the most money with? How can you get this done quickly? Um, especially in college, you know, a bachelor's degree is called a four-year degree a lot of degrees that you have actually take you five years. And for me, that felt like a failure. Like I, I can't take an extra year. <laughs> that makes me one of the, you know, the people who don't learn very quickly. Does that mean I have a learning disability? Does that mean that I'm like, like have a low IQ? Like, am I like mentally retarded if I can't get this done in the amount of time that most people get it done? And the answer is no. It's, I don't know why people call it a four-year degree because it takes most people five years to do it. Um, so I, I think that there's just a lot of, a lot of pressure, a lot of misrepresentation on how things should be. And there's a lot of like peer pressure to do the same things that everybody else is doing. You know, when I was in college, I watched all of my friends get married and then I watched all of them have babies and I felt left out and alone and, I just felt like there was something massively wrong with me because I wasn't meeting the right guy and I wasn't getting married and I wasn't having babies. And then years later, I watched a lot of them get divorced and then I didn't feel so bad. <laughs> and now I feel like I, I skipped the first divorce and I can just move on to the love of my life, hopefully. Um, so I think that's why a lot of people have problems making decisions. I think the other thing is that our families put a lot of pressure on us and we feel a lot of pressure from our friends and, you know, we either the school that you work, that you go to or the place that you work at, we feel pressure to be like everybody else. And we're just not like everybody else. And there isn't enough understanding and acceptance of different personality types. There's just not nowadays. The next question, why are we so complex and different? <laughs> I, honestly, I don't know. Um, we definitely are very complex and very different from other people. I think that it's exaggerated because other people don't understand. And a lot of personality types don't want to understand their personality type. They don't they're not as interested in it as we are. They don't see, they don't see the importance of it like we do. They just know that we're different from them and they don't know why and they don't really wanna know why. And I think that that makes us feel a lot more different and a lot more foreign. And then, you know, like I said before, there's a pressure to be like everybody else. It's like this peer pressure and it's difficult to, to figure out how to deal with that and still stay true to yourself. Um, and then also, you know, when you're young, high school, college, and even like, you know, throughout your twenties and even some people in their early thirties is like, you feel this immense pressure to figure out who you are as a person and you wanna figure it out right now. And at the same time, there's, you know, there's peer pressure to be like everybody else. There's, um, there's pressure from your family to be a certain way. And it's difficult for us as INFJs to even figure out who we are 
because we're not good at looking at ourselves. We are great at looking at other people. We're great at seeing how other people feel about things and making them feel comfortable. And so that makes us like these natural people pleasers, right? And so if you have somebody in your life, like, you know, your parents or maybe your siblings or close friends, and they are looking at you going, you should do this and you should do that, then the most natural thing for us to do is to say, yes, that's the answer. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make my parents happy because that feels like the right thing to do. And I don't know what else to do. And so you do the thing to make your parents happy. And then maybe it takes you a couple of years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years. And you realize that you're miserable, that you're incredibly unhappy and you don't know how to be happy. And if you look back at your life, you can say, oh, well, I went to college and I majored in accounting because my parents thought it was a good idea. You know, I went to college and I became a nurse because my mom is a nurse and she said that it was a great career. And yeah, I make a lot of money, but I hate being a nurse. My mom wanted me to be a nurse. (laughs) That's why I came up with that. And I was like, I don't think I can do that because I don't like all the blood and the gore and I hate needles. And like, that's, and that's not going to work for me. But I see why she wanted me to be a nurse because she's never had a problem getting a job and she makes quite a bit of money and she always has good insurance and all of those things. So it's, it's a very stable career and it, it makes sense, right? I went into marketing and I always have a problem finding a job. Most of the time when I am looking for a job, it takes me at least six months, if not a year to find a new job because marketing is a very competitive field and you know there are are more people than there are jobs and nursing is opposite there are more jobs than there are people who are nurses so when my mom is out of a job or when she wants to find a new job it'll take her a couple of weeks and she'll send out 10 resumes or fill out 10 applications she'll get six interviews and she'll get three offers (laughs) and me I mean I'll fill out hundreds of applications for months and months and months and I'll do tons of phone interviews and and sometimes a bunch of second interviews and and if I'm lucky I'll get one or two offers because it's just so competitive you know so it's like I see why she wanted me to be a nurse um but I know that I would be very unhappy if I was a nurse because I don't like all of, you know, that, I don't like blood. I don't like cuts. I don't like needles. I don't like any of that kind of stuff. Um, my mom had a, um, a splinter in her finger one time when, when, when I was still living at home and my mom will like dig at splinters in her fingers until there's like a massive hole in her finger until she can get it out. Like it has to come out. And so she was digging at this, this splinter in her finger and she couldn't get it out. And it was kind of like an awkward, in an awkward position. And so she asked me if I would help her get it out. And I'm like, Oh, like, Oh, I don't know if I can do this. (laughs) So I'm trying to like dig around in her finger and I'm like, Oh, this is terrible. I don't know if I can do this. And I'm like looking at it with a flashlight going, mom, I don't think there's a splinter in here anymore. I think that it hurts because you've day you've dug a massive hole in your finger and you need to stop. I think that's the problem. (laughs) And I think, I don't know if she ever did find a splinter. She probably asked one of her friends to, to help her with it. But I mean, it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, nope, 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 nope. For some reason, there's a show on TV that's called Dr. Pimple Popper. For some reason, I like watching that show, but I don't know that I could ever like cut somebody's head open or like sometimes it's their arms or something. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it feels like a lot. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. Um, okay. Let's move on to the next question. Um, I always question whether I'm a good person. Am I a good person? Is that an INFJ behavior? This is a really big question. Um, it really depends on how you define being a good person. People define it in different ways. Um, A lot of people look to religion 
to decide whether they're a good person or not. Um, if you don't have a religion in your life, then it's a little bit different um, because you have to look at what you think is morally right and morally wrong. Um, if you look at pop culture, if you look at politics, if you look at what your friends are doing, um, and if you look at different religions even or different spiritualities, you're going to find different answers as to what's what makes you a good person and what makes you not a good person. I don't really look at personality types to decide whether I'm a good person or not because I don't think that any personality type is bad and any one of them is good. I think that we're just different and it takes a lot of understanding. Um, that's what we need to, to um, think about the differences between people and why we act different ways. Being an introvert isn't a good or bad thing. Being an extrovert isn't a good or bad thing. I know that a lot of people place labels on those things, especially <laughs> like, like me, if you work in marketing, they're like, hey, we want an, an outgoing people person who's fun and bubbly and you know a great person. And that, to me, that makes me think that people who aren't out, outgoing, people who aren't fun, or bubbly, that those aren't good people. But that's not correct. You know, you can be a quiet person who is mysterious and sweet and um, gentle and still be a great person. You don't have to be loud and extreme with your emotions, you know, to be, to be a great person. So when I think about, you know, are you a good person? I don't equate that with personality types. When I think about being a good person, I look at my belief in God. I look at what kind of contribution that I make to the world. I look at how I treat other people. I look at how I handle conflict, those types of things. I always want to be a better person. I know that there's a lot of things that I do that, that aren't great. I know that, you know, I can improve in a lot of things. I can offer more understanding than what I'm giving people. Um, I can be more patient, more gentle with people. Um, and I feel like that's how I determine whether I'm a good person or not. And not, you know, what kind of personality I have. Okay, the next question. I'm an INFJ T, how can I be an INFJ A? Being T is super chaotic. I want to be more stable and confident. Okay, so when we first started, we were talking about assertive versus turbulent. You don't find this in the Myers-Briggs type indicator. You find it on 16 Personalities website. So if you go to their website and at the top it says resources and then it'll open up a sub menu and there's an option that says theory. So then it'll tell you that, you know, being assertive would be that you're more self-assured, even tempered and resistant to stress. You don't really worry that much and you push yourself um, to achieve your goals. Being turbulent is more, you're more self-conscious, you're more sensitive to stress. Um, you probably more emotional, you're perfectionistic and you're looking to improve quite a bit. How do you change between the two of those? Honestly, I really don't know. I've always been more turbulent. I am a massive people pleaser. I've been open <laughs> with that. I've been learning a lot about self-love and um, what Ross Rosenberg calls self-love deficiency disorder. So that makes me more self-conscious. I have an anxiety disorder. And so of course I'm more sensitive to stress. I'm more anxious about a lot of things. I'm also very perfectionistic, which I feel like comes from, from my lack of self-love, which is, you know, why I'm self-conscious too. Um, and it comes from wanting to please people, feeling like that's how, that's how I decide if I'm, if I matter or not. That's where I get love is from, from helping other people. And I look at how they look at me and that's, how I look at me. So how do you change that? Well, it's not an easy process. It's not, it's not, it hasn't been easy for me um, to build confidence 
and to stop looking at what other people think of me and, you know, to work through all of the people pleasing behaviors that I have and, um, and to learn how to set boundaries and, and to look at myself to what I think of myself, what my truth is rather than, you know, what other people think of me. It's a process and it takes, it takes time. I would encourage you to check out the episode that I did with Ross Rosenberg, um, the podcast episode that I did, and to check out his book that's called The Human Magnet Syndrome. Um, it's really good. There's another book that I, that I like a lot that's called How to Do the Work. Um, that one is great. And then any books from Byron Katie, she has a process that she calls the work as well. That's, that's also completely fantastic. Okay, the next question, how do I unbecome an INFJ or how do I change my personality type? It's truly hard and stressful. Well, unfortunately, I don't think that you can change your personality type. I don't believe that you can. I think that the best thing that you can do is learn more about your personality type, understand why you are the way that you are, and then learn how to be more gentle with yourself about certain things especially about the things that bother you the most. Another thing that's helped me a lot is to have somebody else to talk to. So, you know, whether that's a support group, whether that's a group of INFJs who feel the same way that, that you do, um, whether it's an outside support group, or maybe even seeing a counselor, um, somebody that you can talk to that will help you work through some of the things that are really difficult and stressful in your life. When I was young, I felt like seeing a counselor was like something that only people with like massive problems did and it was it was looked on as something that was like weak but thankfully um I got to a point in my life where I was struggling a lot and one of my friends said I think you should go see a counselor and I was like oh no I'm not like crazy and she was like well you know, people who aren't crazy go see counselors too. And I'm like, well, I don't know anybody who's ever gone to see a counselor. And she's like, I see a counselor. I see a counselor every single week. And I think that everybody should. And that kind of changed my whole perspective on seeing a counselor. I didn't know that normal people went to see counselors, <laughs> you know, and once I did actually push myself to go, I realized it was really nice to have somebody else to talk to. And the counselor that I was seeing at that time had this new perspective um, on my life and on how I could approach things differently. And it's something as simple as asking questions about how you feel about something. You know, maybe there's this story that you tell yourself that you've always believed is true. Maybe you think that being an introvert is bad or that being shy is bad because everybody has told you that it's something that's really negative that you need to fix. Um, that was something for me that, that happened to me multiple times. When I was in school, I always had these great report cards that were like straight A's, but a lot of my report cards have comments on them that say, well, Sarah's really shy and she doesn't talk to people. She doesn't really have a lot of friends and she needs to open up more. She needs to learn how to speak up in class. And so to me, that was like, a blemish on my report card that was a problem that I had to fix and as I grew up and I learned more about being an introvert and also for me you know I have anxiety as well I realized that being shy and quiet um it's not a bad thing it doesn't make me a bad person it's not a problem that I need to fix it doesn't mean that I'm a broken extrovert it means that I handle situations differently. I want to talk to one person rather than a whole room full of people. And I need time after I talk to people to recharge. That doesn't make me broken. It doesn't make me messed up. It's just a whole different way of looking at things. Um, so maybe that would be really helpful to talk to somebody else who has a different perspective about things or to find some support from other people who have the same personality type as you do. It helps so much just to hear other people say, oh my God, I do the same thing. I do that too. I feel the same way. I've experienced that before. It helps a lot. 
Um, I have a community that I've created that's on my website. Um, you can go to infjwoman.com slash infj community. And I'll put a link for it in the show notes as well. And it's basically just a community for INFJs to help us get to know each other and to learn more about each other, to make friends, hopefully. So maybe you can head over there and join the chat, join some of the groups. There's a forum where there's a lot of different questions and you can add your own questions too. I really encourage people to, because I know that as INFJs, we're more likely to to read everybody else's questions and not, not really participate, but it really only works if everybody else, you know, if everybody who's there starts a conversation. So definitely go check that out. And again, there's a link for it in the show notes. Does your personality change with age? No, I don't believe that your personality changes. I think that we become more aware of certain things. I know that as you get older, you become less self-centered and more, more aware of other people, more aware of how you are as a person, more aware of how what you do affects other people. I think maybe that's what you're seeing change, if you're seeing a change. I know that for me, I'm 36. And when I was in high school and then in college, I was like, I thought that I knew everything. And I wasn't one of those people who was like super arrogant. It's just that I thought that I knew more than everybody else. And as I've grown up, especially the last probably five years, um, I've watched my niece grow up and she's 19 now. I think she's going to be 19 this year. And um, there have been so many situations where I see her acting the same way that I did. I see her having very similar opinions, wanting to do things that I know for me were mistakes. And it's difficult for me to tell her not to do things because I know that if somebody would have told me not to do something, I wouldn't have listened. It just would have made me want to do it even more. But it's like you can see the hurt and the pain coming. You can see that it's going to cause a problem. And it's difficult to like know what to do. So I've, <laughs> I've had so many of these situations and, you know, I've had to like call my parents and say, listen, I know that I thought that you were stupid when you were young and I'm really sorry. As it turns out, you are not stupid. You actually knew exactly what you were talking about. And, um, they always laugh. They think it's really funny. <laughs> I don't think that I was really bad about telling them that they were stupid. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that I made a lot of insinuations like that, but they, <laughs> they certain of, they certainly appreciate my newfound understanding and all of um, my apologies about, you know, like, yeah, I really thought you were stupid, but as it turns out, not so much. Okay, next question. Do you think most INFJs have social phobia or anxiety, or is it just me? Is it common for us to have existential anxiety? I think a lot of INFJs have anxiety, um, especially social anxiety. I think that it comes from the fact that we look at the world differently and we understand that we're different than everybody else. And we have a, a difficult time fitting in with other people. That's something that we recognize very early on in our lives. I've read some books by Lauren Sapala, who's an INFJ, and she talks a lot about INFJ anxiety. So I think it's something that a lot of us deal with. I did a podcast episode with her as well, and you should definitely check it out. I'll put a link for it in the show notes. Um, I think a lot of us have existential anxiety too, because we can see things coming. You know, we, we have this way of predicting the future and it's not like a psychic thing. It's more like an intuition thing. We see patterns of how people behave. And so we kind of know things are coming. There's a saying that says that history repeats itself and it's totally true. A lot of people have patterns of behavior and they just keep doing the same things over and over again. You know, people talk about how difficult it is to change and it really is extremely difficult. 
so once you understand somebody's patterns, then you can kind of see how things are going to happen because you know they're going to do the same thing that they've always done because that's what, that's what they do. And it's true for us too. You know, it's really difficult for us to change too. So we know that we're going to do the same thing. Once you start to understand your own patterns, then you're like, okay, this is how this is going to happen. Like, this is always how it happens and this is what's going to happen. So it's easy for us to have existential anxiety. I think a lot of that too revolves around feeling fulfilled in your life, feeling like you have a purpose and that you're making the world a better place. It also comes from the people that we surround ourselves with. A lot of us have self-love deficiency problems, you know, like I was talking about my problems with that. And so we end up, we end up surrounding ourselves with people who aren't great for us. And then we feel bad about having those people in our lives, but then we feel bad about removing those people from our lives. And it's difficult when those people are your family members or your husband or your wife, you know, it's difficult when they're close friends or, you know, maybe it's your boss. And so it's going to require a big change for you to, to remove those people from your life. There's, there's somebody in my life recently who they do something that I've asked them not to do. And it bothers me every time that they do it. And it's kind of a really big thing. And I've asked them multiple times not to do it. I've told them that I don't like it, that it hurts me and it causes me a lot of anxiety and a lot of problems. But for some reason, this person just keeps doing this thing. And so I have kind of struggled with how many times do I tell them they need to stop before I just decide that they're not going to stop and I need to do something else, you know? And it's difficult because I really like this person. They're a really good friend, sort of. (laughs) I mean, for the most part, they're a really good friend except for this one thing. But this one thing is a big thing for me. And every time it comes up, it makes me have a really bad day, sometimes two or three days. And it's like, why do I keep doing this to myself? And so for me, I feel like at this point, it's time for me to start distancing myself from that person because I've set boundaries. I've told them it's a problem and they're not respecting my boundaries. So if I don't continue to enforce those boundaries, then there's no reason to keep setting those boundaries, right? If, if I'm just going to let them walk all over me and I know that that makes me feel bad when they do it, then the problem isn't with them anymore. It's with me. So I need to decide, is it okay for them to keep doing this or do I need to do something else? And so for me, I've kind of decided that I need to do something else. I need to make a change because it's not okay what keeps happening. And I want something different in my life. So, I mean, for me, that's a part of existential anxiety. I feel like a lot of times I know what my purpose is and I'm set in a certain course, but there are still times when I question it. There are still times when I wonder, you know, am I doing enough? Is is there something else I should be doing? And I think those are the times where I really have to think about who I wanna be as a person. What kind of contribution do I wanna make to the world? Can I, is there something else that I can do to help people while I'm here? So, you know, when I, when I get into that mindset, I I look at how can I help other people and that, that helps me get out of it and start thinking about what I can be doing rather than, you know, what I'm not doing or what I missed out on. Okay. Next question. Why do people think INFJs have a negative mindset? I think that we can have a negative mindset. I tend to focus more on negativity. I think it's kind of a habit. It probably comes from my family, but then it also comes from me wanting to prepare for the worst. People always say, you know, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. But sometimes when you're focused on the worst that you're preparing for, sometimes you forget to think about best case scenario. And so you end up looking more negative and maybe thinking and acting more negative because you're focused on preparing for the worst 
right? You're focused on what could happen. And, you know, I talked about before, we, we focus on patterns that people have in their lives. So we kind of know what's going to happen. And sometimes it is really negative. Um, it's difficult once you get stuck in that spiral to pull yourself out of it. But if you've created a pattern in your life of being negative, then you can create a pattern of being positive too. It might take a lot of, a lot of work, but it's something that you can do. It's something that you can change. Just the same as people who never exercise start exercising. The same as people who never drink water start drinking water. Um, you can change the way that you think about things. And once you start to notice yourself being negative, then you can, you can make it a habit to say, okay, I'm not going to be negative. I'm going to focus on best case scenario, or I'm going to look for things that I'm grateful for. I started meditating last year. And one of the first meditations that I did was like a guided meditation from Gabby Bernstein, where she talks about being grateful for little things and little things to where they're like almost minute things, you know? So when you start noticing yourself having a negative mindset, then you can, you can just sit in a place that's, you know, hopefully quiet. And you can start thinking about all the things that you're thankful for. Like, I'm thankful for the chair that I'm sitting on. I'm thankful for the computer that's in front of me. I'm thankful for my phone. I'm thankful, you know, that I have a safe place to live. I'm thankful for the air conditioning or the heater. I'm thankful for the electricity, you know, every single little thing. And then once you start listing all of those things, then you'll notice that your mind starts to change. You're not so focused on what you don't have or what hasn't happened yet. You start focusing on more of what you do have. And it changes the way that you think about things. Okay, next question. Is it INFJ to know something before people say it and play dumb so they can speak? Yes, I believe that it definitely is. Uh, most INFJs are very smart and we're very quick about the way that our mind works. We think very quickly. I was talking before about noticing patterns in people. Um, we also, you know, have this very powerful intuition. And so we know what's going to happen, right? We can predict what people are going to say. And the more that we know them, the more that we can predict what they're going to say. Some people, it takes them a while to put their thoughts together. Some people just have this habit of pausing when they speak. It's one of the things that drives me insane about people. <laughs> it's one of my own personal pet peeves, but it's also one of the ways that I like to practice patience with people. <laughs> um, um, my dad does it too. Like he'll start a sentence and he'll pause for a few minutes. Sometimes it seems like a few minutes. It's probably not a few minutes, but he'll pause. It's like he's trying to put his words together or he's trying to think through something while he's talking about it. And I already know what he's going to say. And so in the past, I would like rush him through the thinking process and finish his sentence and then keep talking about what I was talking about. But I've learned to be a lot more patient because what I think he's going to say isn't always what he's going to say. So generally, I try to be more understanding of people. I try to understand, especially in those moments where you're being impatient and you want to keep going. I try to think about the fact that not everybody thinks as fast as we do. Not everybody can put things together as quickly as we do. It's part of our intuition that we connect dots to different information. And so, and we do it very quickly. And so it's easy for us to come to a conclusion really quickly. And it's not always that easy for other people. Um, I think I have more understanding of this too, because it's happened to me more <laughs> where sometimes I lose my train of thought and that's like really bad. Um, other times it's more like I'm trying to figure out the right way to say something. And so I pause, like, you know, I know I want to say something that's super straightforward, but I'm trying to figure out how to say it where it's not so cutting. So I think, you know, that's one of those things that comes from being a little bit older too. You start to, to have more understanding for other people and you start to be more patient with them because you've been in those situations before. Okay, next question. 
why is it hard for me to get along with everyone and feel connected to them, especially friends? It's difficult for us as INFJs to make friends because we don't like to be open about ourselves. Um, it's always been difficult for me. I've always had a problem making friends. Um, another one of the reasons why it's difficult for me is because I'm not interested in the things that most people are interested in. I always felt like I was a lot older than the people that I was in school with when I was like in grade school and college because they were always interested in things that I felt like were so trivial. You know, they were interested in the latest fashion things, you know, shoes and purses and, and makeup and stuff like that. And I thought it was just so ridiculous. Like, why do you sit around for hours and talking about the new shoes that you bought? Like, <laughs> why do you want to go to the mall and, and look at 12 different places that have shoes that just, why, why don't you just pick one and move on to something else? For me, I wanted to read books. I wanted to talk about ideas and concepts and nobody else wanted to talk about that. They all thought that I was strange for doing that. Um, when I got to college, you know, high school and college, people were talking a lot about dating. And my older sister used to torture me with all these dating advice books. <laughs> and every once in a while, she would find one that she was just stuck on and she loved and it was awesome and it was great advice. And so she would make me read it and I would sit there and read it and feel like my brain was literally melting while I was reading it because it was just such trivial nonsense to me. The advice in these books was like, you've got to be joking. People actually do this. Like, no wonder so many people marry the wrong people, you know, like, why would you play games with people? Why don't you just sit down and talk about your feelings and find somebody, you know, talk about like the meaning of life and, and the best book that you read and, and watch a documentary and talk about, you know, those types of ideas and things like, why would you intentionally cook a bad dinner just to make sure that your boyfriend won't ever ask you to cook dinner again? Like, that's insane. Like, don't you want to impress them with your cooking skills, whether you can or not? Don't you want to let them know that you can take care of them? And so, I mean, for me, like, dating to me was always not fun. It was like, still like torture. I don't want to date people just to date. I want to find somebody to spend the rest of my life with. And so I was always a lot more serious about dating than, than other people were too. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of reasons why it's hard for us to get along with people. Even now, you know, my friends, a lot of my friends talk about shows like The Bachelor and The Real Housewives of whatever. And I'm like, I can't watch those shows. I've tried. And it's like, I tried to watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians and no offense to the Kardashians, but to me, the stuff that they talk about on the show is like mind numbing. It's like, why, why talk about that kind of stuff? You talk about so many other things, you know, you can read some of the best books that have ever been written by anyone ever alive, or you can talk about what color of lipstick is the best one to wear. I mean, you know, it's, and the people, like there's some people at work who, when we were in the office, they had like this lunch club where everybody would go out to lunch and they would literally spend two or three hours every single day negotiating on where to go to lunch so that 10 or 15 of them could go to lunch at the same place or go get lunch and then bring it back to the office. And to me, I'm like, why do I want to negotiate with 10 people about where I'm going to eat? Why won't, doesn't it make more sense for me to just go to the place that I want to eat and then eat? <laughs> why does this need to be a three hour process? That's not fun for me. That's like torture. So I think that's, that's a big problem. You know, that's a lot of it is like the things that we think are important. The things that we find fun and enjoyable are not the same things that a lot of people find fun and enjoyable. They're not the, the same things that people think are important. And that's not the end of the world to me. It used to be, I used to be really worried that nobody liked me, that I didn't have any friends and that, you know, nobody invited me to their birthday parties. I didn't go to sleepovers like everybody else did. It used to bother me a lot, but now I just really don't care. I would rather 
buy my own lunch and eat lunch by myself because then I don't have to negotiate with people and I don't have to deal with all of them talking about all the things they're talking about (laughs) you know a lot of them like to watch sports too since I moved to Boston you know there's a lot of people talk about football and baseball and basketball and hockey and I'm like I can't I that's not interesting to me. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> it's not, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to watch it so that I can participate in the conversation. I have better things to do. So, I mean, obviously that's a reason that we don't feel connected to people because we're not interested in the same things that they are. They're not interested in the things that we're interested in either. I would really encourage you to find friends who have a similar personality type. Since I've started my blog and, and my Instagram account and everything, I found a lot of friends who are INFJs and it helps immensely because they are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. They want to talk about the meaning of life and they want to sit around for hours and talk about it. They like to read books that are like, you know, talk about concepts like the meaning of life, like how to make your life better. Um, they like to watch documentaries, the same ones that I watch. And so, you know, I think that's, that's how you find people that you feel really connected to and find people that you get along with really well. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you get along with everybody. You can change your personality or you can change your outward projection of your personality to get along with other people. I've done that in the past. I've tried, I've put forth an effort. I've watched Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I watched football for a few seasons, you know. I have watched series on TV that other people liked just to have something to talk about with them. It didn't change the fact that I didn't like football or that I didn't like the series that I was watching. And it didn't make me feel more connected to them once I knew something about what they were talking about. It just made me feel more bored. It made me feel kind of disappointed with myself because I put so much time and effort to trying to get somebody else to like me when I didn't really even like them. So, I mean, I would consider all of the options there before you start start trying to get people to like you. It's really easy to fall into that trap, you know? But you have to really think about, do you really like them? Is that somebody that you really want to spend a lot of time with? Do you really want to watch football every single week just to have something to talk about with this person? Because they're going to think that you like football and then you're going to have to do it forever. And you might feel like it's torture to do that. And then eventually, maybe six months down the road, maybe a year or two years or five years, you're going to realize you don't want to watch football anymore. And they're not going to know who you are as a person because you've told them that you like football or you've told them that you like the Kardashians or you've told them that you like shopping when you really don't. And so it's almost like you create this whole other persona of yourself just to fit in with what this person likes. And then when you finally give up the ruse of like, you know what? I don't really like football. I don't really like shopping. I don't really like the Kardashians you're not going to have anything in common with them. And they're going to feel like you lied to them because you kind of did. And they're not going to like you because they didn't like you to begin with. They liked the person that you became so that they would like you. So I would encourage you to really, really think about, you know, the people that you want to get along with, the people that you want to feel connected with. And, and to be honest, I think that's the best, the best way to go. How do you say no to a friend who wants to visit? <laughs> that's, that's always been really difficult for me. <laughs> I kind of have a rule in my house that nobody comes over to my house. So that way people don't, they don't feel slighted when I don't invite them. When I go out with my friends, like I, we go out to coffee or we go out to a restaurant somewhere, or we go do something together. They don't really come to my house. And thankfully, most of my friends are also that way. They're like, no, you don't come over to my house. We'll, we'll go out to a restaurant, but we're not like, you know, you're not going to come over to my house. It's different if you have friends who don't live in the same place. You know, if they live in different parts of the country, then some of my friends have invited me to stay with them, you know, for 
for a few days or for a week or something. Um, I've invited people to stay at my house too, you know, like friends who are out of state, they never come. <laughs> so I don't know if there's something like, if they just don't put forth the effort to come see me, I always have to go see them. Um, or if maybe there's something wrong with my house. I don't know. None of them have ever been to my house though. <laughs> so maybe that's the problem. Saying no to friends is always difficult. It's, it's always, for me, you know, it's like this almost like an existential crisis because I always want to make other people happy. I want them to like me, first of all, because, you know, I have a lot of people pleasing problems. Um, so it's difficult for me to say no to people. But I think that it's important to set boundaries with people. Obviously, there's a reason that you don't want them to visit you. And I think that it's important to be honest with them, to be upfront. It's a whole lot easier to make up a story, you know, to make up an excuse or to blame it on your husband or your kids or your dog. You know, they're eventually they're going to see through that, right? Because they're not going to stop. And so it's a whole lot easier for you to say something like, listen, my house is kind of my sacred space. And I appreciate that, you know, you want to come and see me. I understand that. I would be okay with you coming for two days or, you know, I'm not really okay with you staying at my house. I don't have enough room, you know, or whatever the reason may be and suggesting somewhere else for them to stay. If this is somebody that you don't want to be a part of your life, then I think that it's important for you to address why. It's not easy. It's certainly not easy. There are friends in my life that I've had to part ways with. And so it's very awkward and it's difficult to have those conversations, but it's important because if you don't do it now, you're going to have to do it later, or you're going to have to put up with them invading your space. So, I mean, you really have to make the choice of which, which difficult do you want to deal with? Do you want to deal with setting boundaries and saying, you know, this is what I need from you, or this is what I can't handle? Or do you want to put up with them being in your house? And is it a day? Is it two days? Is it a week? Is it a month? Are they going to show up at your house and never leave? I mean, you really have to have to think about, you know, what you can deal with. Which difficult do you want to handle? All right, next question. As an INFJ, I feel people... This one is really difficult, okay. As an INFJ, I feel people difficult to understand me and so rarely to meet somebody who does. Why don't people understand me? Please help. No one likes me. My relatives hate me. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same way, actually. <laughs> um, most people don't make an effort to understand you. And I think that that's the first thing to understand, right? When you're trying to figure out why people don't like you, why they don't understand you, you have to meet them with their level of understanding. You have to understand that most people don't want to understand. Most people don't put forth the effort to understand people. Most people are very self-centered and self-focused. They're only concerned with themselves. They're concerned with with their life, their job, their kids, their husband or wife, they're focused on how things affect them. If you know their personality type, it's a little bit easier to figure out how to communicate with them, right? So if you're, if your friend or the, you know, the person that you want to understand you, if they have a thinking personality type and you keep coming at them with feelings, they're not going to understand you because they don't have deep feelings like you do. They think about things logically and rationally. If you're an introvert and you know, you're quiet and shy and, and the people around you are mostly extroverted and outgoing, they're not going to understand you and they're probably not going to like you either because they're used to people who are loud and outgoing and here's somebody who's quiet and likes to be alone. And they're like, what's wrong with you? 
not that there's something wrong with you. That's just the way that people think. So you have to look at their level of understanding, right? Remember that most people are, are self-centered and that they don't want to understand. So if your way of making them understand is to try to explain yourself to them, they don't care. And that's just going to make it worse, unfortunately. I think that the idea that no one likes you, because I've had that idea myself, I've realized that I was trying to make people like me who didn't. I thought that if people didn't like me, then it was my job to make people like me. I thought that, it, you know, if I could be the teacher's pet and be the helper at home and be the best at my job, that people would like me because I was doing a good thing for them. I was helping them, you know. Um, I realized that most people liked me less because of those things, because they saw me as the goody two shoes or the brown noser, or, you know, the person who always did all the work and got all the awards. And rather than liking me, they would want me to do their work and they wouldn't like me. They didn't like me to begin with. And then they wouldn't like me if I didn't do their work. So I think the idea that no one likes you isn't correct. Maybe the people around you aren't particularly happy with you, but that's okay. That doesn't mean that they are all the people in the world. There are almost 8 billion people in the world. And just because the few people that you're surrounded with aren't particularly taken with you, that doesn't mean that there's nobody in the world that will like you. You just have to find your people. Um, the last part of, of the question was my relatives hate me. I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I don't really know most of my family, my extended family, the people that I do know, I really haven't had a great relationship with the ones that I liked have passed away. I liked my great grandma a lot and she passed away. I liked one of my grandpas a lot and he passed away too. The one aunt that I had that I liked that I talked to from time to time, she passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, just a couple of months ago. And to me, it's really sad that I haven't known a lot of my relatives and that the ones that I did know that I liked have already passed away. And there's been a lot that I don't even know who they are. I look at other people who have these big families that they spend a lot of time with and they get along with. And I'm kind of envious of them, honestly, because I haven't had that experience. When I was growing up, my mom never liked her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law never liked her. And it wasn't just specific to my mom and her mother-in-law. There were other people in our family that were like, they just didn't like each other. And so when I've met people now who like their mother-in-law, I'm like, what? you have a good relationship with your in-laws? I didn't know that could happen. I thought that it was just normal that people didn't like their in-laws and their in-laws didn't like them. Um, so I realized that there's a lot, there's a lot of my family that was maybe not great and not a good example and not really, not really the experience that everybody else has too. Um, it's difficult when your relatives don't like you and you don't like your relatives. Um, I have three siblings. I don't talk to any of them. My brother has autism. And so he doesn't really like talking on the phone. And honestly, I don't really think he likes me that much. <laughs> He's nine years younger than me. And we never really had that much in common. Both of my sisters have severe problems with narcissism. And, you know, one of them has a substance abuse problem. The other one is just very self-centered and narcissistic. And so I don't talk to either of them. And there have been times in our life where we've had close relationships with both of them. And so to me, it's really sad that we don't have close relationships now. And I feel bad. And sometimes I feel like I want to fix it. But I know that the one who has substance abuse problems, she still has those problems. And she's not the person that I used to know. And there's nothing I can do to help her because she doesn't think that she has a problem and she doesn't want help. She has to decide that she, that she has a problem and that she wants help in order for me to help her. And the other one, 
she doesn't think that she's ever done anything wrong. And so me reaching out to her isn't going to change anything because she doesn't even want to recognize how she's hurt me and how she's hurt other members of our family. And so it's difficult, you know, being in that situation where you don't have a close family and you don't really have any relatives that you even talk to. I understand that. I don't know how to fix that. I don't know that there is a fix for it. You know, I think that it's better to find people that you get along with and that you like and who value and appreciate you. I think that's why a lot of people feel like their friends are more like their family because a lot of people, their friends treat them better than their family ever has. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's just the experience of some people. And you know, you do the best that you can do with what you have. Okay, next question. How do you find love being an introvert and socially awkward? <laughs> you're, you're asking the wrong person, basically. I was one of those people who's, who wanted to be married when I was like 20 years old. I wanted to have my first baby when I was 20 years old because my mom had her first baby at 20 years old. My grandma actually had her first baby at 16, which I realize is way too young, but she had her second one at 18. And so I thought that, you know, if I could be a young mom, then I could like grow up with my child and relate to them more. And, you know, I just thought that you were supposed to be 20 years old when you had your first child and I'm 36 and I don't have any kids. And I, you know, I struggle with dating. Um, I don't relate to a lot of the guys that are available and maybe part of it is like the dating app thing has never really been a, a fun thing for me. It feels more like torture than anything else. And I think part of the problem for me is that I feel like I'm extremely judgmental of people. I have very high standards and I know exactly what I want. And I'm not to the point yet where I'm ready to compromise those standards. And I don't know, like, I don't know how many of them that I really want to compromise. I think, I think another problem for me is that I've gotten very, very comfortable being alone. I like having free time. I like having my own space. I like not having to negotiate with people um it just feels more comfortable so in order for me to fall in love with somebody they're going to have to be very special you know they're gonna have to be somebody who makes my life better than what it is with me being alone and that's that's a lot um as far as being socially awkward I'm very socially awkward I, <laughs> I struggle with people that I don't know, like, I don't know how to talk to them. And especially when it's a really hot guy that I would really like to talk to. It's like, I forget how to speak English and how to put sentences together. And, you know, like, I really want to impress them, but then, you know, I can't remember my own name or what I was going to say. <laughs> The, the only thing that I can really relate to with this, which is probably a really silly example, but as you can see behind me, I really like the new kids on the block a lot. And um, I like to go to their concerts because they go on tour every other year. And a lot of times I go to meet and greet too. And so those are the type of guys, I mean, I know that they're celebrities and, and I think that most of them are like really super hot. And so it's like, I want to say something really, really cute to them or like really funny. I want to be like, you know, just, I want to say something that's like really awesome. And so I'll even practice what I'm going to say ahead of time because I can't come up with something on the spot. That's not how my personality works. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I'll figure out what to say ahead of time and then I'll rehearse it so that I can say it perfectly when I get there. And I realize you can't do this with like a lot of people. I mean, unless it's like somebody that you work with or somebody that you know, then, you know, you can find it, kind of figure out something to say, but I'll rehearse it perfectly. I've even like said it to my friends and, and, you know, my niece and like, had people critique what I'm going to say. And 
um, which I understand is also very awkward, but it's part of how I, a part of how I operate. But what happens is I always get there in the moment. And even though I've met them several times, so like, I feel like I shouldn't be star starstruck. It's always like, there's this one, one of them that every time I am standing in front of him, instead of just like saying what I want to say and being super cute and charming and funny, which I feel like I can be at certain times, but not in front of him. No, in front of him, I'll say things that aren't even sentences. And he usually looks at me like, are, what? Like, are you speaking English? And, you know, then I, I, it always turns out very bad and awkward. And it's kind of funny, like how bad these things have gone. And the fact that I keep paying to, you know, have these types of experiences is even more funny. It's one of those things. It's like, oh my God, this is so bad. It's like really funny, but I don't know how to make it better. So as far as finding love, yeah, you're asking the wrong person. I've tried the dating sites. None of them seem to work. Um, I've honestly talked to a couple of people that are like matchmakers. There's this one company that's called It's Just Lunch that I've thought about trying, but they're like super expensive and they're like, well, we'll guarantee you like four dates for $5,000 over six months. And I'm like, four dates. <laughs> like, what, what kind of dates are these people? Like they have to be really good for $5,000 over six months. I mean, maybe the problem is I just don't have that kind of money. So I'm not really like their ideal client, I guess. So I, I don't know, honestly, how you find love. I've asked a lot of other people because I really want to know how you meet people. And a lot of them have these super cute stories. Like my best friend, was married and she got a divorce. And so she had to move out of their house and she moved into an apartment where she had three roommates and one of her roommates turned out to be the love of her life. And I'm like, Oh, that's disgusting. I can't move in with roommates. I'm not one of those people who can handle roommates. <laughs> and so, you know, one of my friends, her husband uh, was her high school sweetheart. Obviously I'm past that stage. My parents have this great story where um, my mom was working in a cafe and um, there was a guy who came in that had like this really nice car. And so my mom made a bet with all of her friends, the other servers that, you know, to see which one of them could, could get a date with this guy who had this really nice car. And um, it turned out to be my dad. So I, I hear all these really cute stories of people and I keep thinking that one of these days I'm going to go into Starbucks and meet the love of my life. And I hope that happens. I don't know. Okay. Why is it so difficult for INFJs to find good quality people to be in relationships with? I think it's really difficult to find good quality people just in general. Honestly, I think part of it could be where you're looking. I think part of it is their personality types. Some personality types, INFJs get along with really well and others we have a lot of differences with. And so I think that's part of it. And as far as, you know, dating, like I just said, I feel like apps are like the worst place to find people. <laughs> and that's just my own personal frustration with dating. I know a lot of people find the perfect significant other on dating apps, but for me, I haven't really had that experience. The best friends that I found have come from like Instagram and my blog and stuff like that, my podcast. And I found a lot of good friends that I've worked with in the past. So who knows, maybe that's where you find the right person to go out with. I haven't yet, but, but it's possible. I have dated a lot of guys that I've worked with though. So none of those relationships have worked out, but that's, how, that's where I found people. And I found one guy at church and my mom keeps suggesting that I go to church on a regular basis and 
she thinks that's where I'm going to find the love of my life, but I'm not really sold on churchy guys. The true believers kind of scare me because they're a lot more churchy than I am. And, um, I feel like that's like, that's what you run into at church, at least the religion that my parents are anyway. Um, okay. How can I build a relationship and feel comfortable? Is it harder for INFJs to form connections with people than other Myers-Briggs types? I feel like it is difficult for INFJs to build relationships and to feel comfortable. Part of it is that we have such deep feelings and a lot of us have been hurt before. You know, we've shared some really important things with other people and they don't understand how important those things are to us. And it's easy for us to get hurt. We have really deep feelings. Um, we have really deep emotions and a lot of people aren't that deep. And so maybe they don't even realize that they've hurt us. And it's difficult for us to be vulnerable and to open up to people and to even tell them how badly they've hurt us. So you end up putting up a wall. You know, you end up not wanting to share things with people because you've been hurt in the past. And I think that's why it's difficult. It takes practice being able to share things with people. And it takes somebody who actually cares about you. And sometimes that's difficult to find, right? I have a few friends now who I feel like they really care about me. And when I say something, they listen to what I'm saying. And they repeat back to me what I've said at different times. Like I know that they're listening because they'll bring up something that I said, you know, six months later. And to me, that's kind of, I like it, but I hate it at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's like, most people don't listen, but then you run into a couple of people who do and you're like, oh crap. Like you remembered that thing that I said, why are you throwing that in my face right now? <laughs> you know? And so I think it really depends on the person that, that you're trying to make a connection with and whether they're really invested in trying to make a connection with you or they're just there because they're there, you know? Some people really care and some people, they don't really care. Maybe they're just using you for some type of advantage. And I've realized that it's usually the people that I'm the most interested in who don't care that much about me. And it's usually the people that I overlook who are the people who end up being the best people in my life. I don't know why that is. Maybe I have a bad sense of like, I get stuck on people though. Like there's a couple of people even now that I keep thinking like our relationship didn't work, our friendship didn't work. And so I want to like reconnect with those people, but I have so far, I'm stopping myself from doing that because it seems like every time there's been somebody that I really wanted to be friends with and I've tried to push a friendship, like do whatever I can to make it you know, to make us be friends. Those are always the situations where they end up like running away from me because maybe it's just that I'm too aggressive or, or there just really wasn't a connection there at all. And I tried to make there be a connection because I really liked them as people. Um, but those are always the people that are like, it never works. But for some reason, I still feel like I want to make it work. I want to keep pushing and figure out if there's a way to make it work. Um, most of my really good friends though, have been people that I think I overlooked in the beginning. Um, one of my really good friends, I was working at this company and they hired this new lady and I looked at her and went, no, uh-uh why in the world would you hire this person <laughs> like I don't get it and after working with her just like a few days I think it was barely a week she was like standoffish and rude and arrogant and you know like she knew exactly what she wanted and nobody was going to tell her anything else and and um 
I just really didn't connect with her. I even went to my boss and I was like, listen, I don't mean to be rude or to overstep my bounds, but I really don't like this person. And I don't think that, that they're going to work. You know, I think that you should really reconsider this. And my boss was like, really? Why? And I'm like, well, you know, I have several examples here. And she's like, I really thought that you would like that person. And I was like, why? And she goes, well, you guys are so much alike. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> you think that I'm like rude and standoffish? You think that I'm super arrogant and that I know exactly what I want? And she's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I've never saw myself that way, but maybe I am. And um, so after, you know, obviously the the person stayed on working there. And after a while, I think kind of after that sort of rude awakening for me, I tried to, to give her more of a chance. And um, we ended up becoming really, really good friends. And even, even now, though I haven't worked with her in more than three years, we still text each other quite a bit. We used to hang out before the pandemic. Um, hopefully we will again. But um, we still text each other a lot. And, um, she's one of those people who has like called me out on some of the worst things, you know, some of the bad things that I've done. And she's one of those people that I know that's like, that will tell me the truth. And it's like, she will tell me the truth as brutal as I tell other people the truth. And very few people are like that. Um, and it's painful, you know, when she tells me like one of these really hard cutting truths, but it's also, is a really good thing. It's, it's helped me so much to see some, like some things about myself and my personality and the way that I handle things that other people won't tell me. And I appreciate her for doing that. I appreciate her for being so honest, building a relationship. Um, it depends on the people that you're around. Um, in order to feel comfortable, you have to be willing to be vulnerable and you have to be willing to be honest with them too. Uh, those, you know, those have been the people that I like the most, the people who are willing to call me out on my bullshit and say, you know, you're lying to yourself and you need to stop. Okay. <clears throat> I always feel like I'm the one who's remembering small details about others, making them feel loved. Um, but no one does that in return for me. Is this an INFJ thing? Yes, this is very much an INFJ thing. INFJs are very good at noticing little details about other people. We're very good at using our intuition to be able to read other people. We're great at giving them advice because we can look at both the logical and the feeling side of, of what's happening in their lives. And we can dig down deeper than what they're saying. You know, they may be telling us one thing and, and for some reason our intuition is telling us, no, it's something else. It's something deeper. It's something bigger than this. Um, that's why we're really good at being counselors. And we usually end up as being our nat you know, natural counselors to our friends and our family members because we see things that other people don't and we're willing to be honest with them because we want to help them. We genuinely want to help them as much as we can. And so, like I said, we remember small details. We want to make people feel happy. We want to make them feel loved and feel appreciated and feel understood. And I think a lot of that comes from people not understanding us, right? And so we want to do all the things for them that we would like people to do for us. And so some people feel like this is overwhelming, <laughs> like it's too much. Other people like it a lot because they don't feel understood. You know, people don't remember things about them. People don't make them feel special and loved and wanted. And so it's a good feeling for them. Um, the fact that nobody does it in return, that's a normal thing, unfortunately, because a lot of people don't think the way that we think. A lot of people don't naturally notice small details about people. And like I said, a lot of people are very self-centered and they're only focused on themselves. 
and they're not so much focused on other people like you. So it's important to meet people where they are, you know, to, to say that other people can only understand based on their level of understanding. And especially when you're young, people are very self-centered when they're young and it takes a while to grow out of that. It could be a personality type thing. Some people are more naturally focused on themselves and not so much other people. INFJs were opposite. We're focused on other people and not so much on ourselves. So, you know, another thing to consider too is, is love languages. People feel loved differently than they express love a lot of times. And a lot of people look at how they feel loved and they give that to other people. So if they feel loved when people give them gifts, then they feel like the best way to make you feel loved is to give you a gift, right? And maybe you don't feel loved by getting a gift. You feel loved by through like quality time or through attention. Um, but they don't feel loved that way. And so they don't understand that you feel loved in a different way than they feel loved or than they generally express love. So, you know, part of it is understanding its personality types, its love languages. There's a lot of different levels, a lot of different layers there. It is normal for INFJs, though, to not get that same level of understanding from other people. I felt that a lot. Another thing that I've realized, too, is that when people do remember small details about me, when they do maybe not give me the same level that I give them, but start to even scratch the surface, I feel really weird because I'm used to them not showing me that type of attention. And so when they do, I'm like, oh, um, I don't know what to do. This is super weird. Like we talked about that like six months ago. Like, how do you, how do you remember that? <laughs> so that's something to consider too, that you're so used to showing everybody else attention that when you get it back, that it doesn't feel the same as what you think that it should. And I don't know how to fix that. Honestly, I, it's something that I've, I've struggled with. I realized though, that once people do start to pay attention to you like that, then I tend to gravitate towards those kind of people. And I usually expect more from them. And then that ends up being like this cycle that sets me up for failure because once you expect more from somebody, they don't always give you what you expect. But yes, it's very much an INFJ thing. Okay, next question. Sometimes it makes me tired, um, my social relationships. So it makes me think all the time. It's not really a question, it's more of a statement. <laughs> I understand. Um, my friendships make me feel tired a lot too, especially when I have friends who want a lot of attention. I don't like people who are constantly texting me like all of the time that ends up being too much. I tend to not be friends with people who want to hang out all of the time because that's too much for me as well. I like people who want to go out to dinner like once a month and who are willing to plan it like a week or two ahead of time. I've realized that more and more <laughs> about myself as I've gotten older. Those are the friendships that I tend to do really well with, the people who don't need that much attention. They're more like me, they like their free time, they like to, to have you know plenty of time and space by themselves. I think that it's important in relationships and in friendships to set boundaries to know what you need and to be upfront about it to ask for it if you need more time than what they're willing to give you then you need to stand up and say you know we can hang out once a week and I need 24 hours notice it's not rude to do that it might be weird because maybe your friends have never had somebody who's done that but you need to think about what you need. That's just as important as what your friends need. I had a friend several years ago who we used to go out to lunch quite frequently, but she would never, 
you could never just call her and say, hey, do you want to go out to lunch today? She would always need at least two days notice. And at first, you know, when I first met her, I thought that was kind of rude because all the friends that I had had in the past, and especially like my older sister, we used to go out to lunch all the time. And we would just call each other like even 10 or 15 minutes before lunch and be like, hey, do you want to go out to lunch? And, you know, we would make plans that way. So for me, it was strange when I met somebody new and they were like, no, I need like two days notice. But it was also something that I got used to. And then I asked her about it later and she said, I'm not the type of person who can just make changes to my plans. She's like, I want to know ahead of time what's happening so that I can be prepared for it. And it's not just like about work. It's also about, you know, what I personally need. And that made a lot more sense to me. Um, and then I was a lot more willing to accommodate her and to make sure that, you know, when I made plans, I didn't suggest times that were like the next day. I always, I always, you know, gave her like two or three days and then, you know, maybe next week too, so that she would have plenty of times to pick from. It's important, especially as introverts, to give yourself time to recharge. I like to use my weekends as time to recharge. So if I'm going to make plans for the weekend, I only make plans for one day. And I also have like rules about, I don't want to go, like if I'm going with somebody somewhere, I'll take my own car so that I can leave whenever I feel like I need to leave. My friends know that like two or three hours is the max that I want to spend somewhere. If it's more than that, then I need to make an early exit, you know, and that's okay with them. They understand that, um, that I have limits being an introvert. <laughs> I'm not an all day type of person. I'm a, I'm a dinner type of person or, you know, a, a short dinner and a movie type of person. Um, so it's important to communicate those things and to be upfront about them. It's a lot better to explain to your friends that you're an introvert, you know, and there's a time limit to how much time you can spend with them rather than to just try and make excuses. They'll appreciate you more for being honest. And once they get to know that about you and that you've set boundaries and you keep those boundaries, then they'll expect it in the future. And it won't be such a difficult thing. They'll be more open to making accommodations for you because they see that's how you operate all the time. Um, okay. What's the hardest part of having a friend exactly the same type as you? Um, I actually like having friends who are INFJs. I have a couple of friends who are like really good friends who are INFJs. I think the most difficult part is sometimes when I want to challenge myself to get outside of my comfort zone, they, they're not always open to the same type of challenges. And they tend to, I wouldn't say hold me back, but they tend to point out, you know, where the, the issues could be. They want me to be aware of what could go wrong. So I would say that's part of it. You have to remember that you're going to have the same weaknesses or very similar weaknesses. And you're also going to have to remember that they might be more introverted than you are. They might want to spend more time alone you know, so while you spend time alone, they might be a little bit more so than you are. Um, so you just have to be aware of that. It's important for me though, to know my friend's personality type so that I can know how to approach them. And so that I kind of know how they're going to react to things. I feel like it makes our friendships better and stronger because I know where they're coming from and I, I can show up for them with more understanding than if I didn't know. I don't know how to talk about my feelings with other people, but I want to, how do I do that? Um, it depends on the person, first of all. Sometimes when you share feelings, it can overwhelm other people. So I would encourage you to be gentle about the way that you start opening up to people. It depends on what type of friends that you have and you know what level of friendship you're at. I think the best way to go is to start 
little by little and see how they react, see how they, um, if they're going to be open to you as well, um, or if they're going to shut down. One of my friends, it seems like every time I try to open up to them, they end up saying something like, yeah, okay. And then they'll like abruptly change the subject. And so for me, I always know that like, okay, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> that's not, that's not somewhere to go with them. If they're asking you more questions, if they're, you know, wanting to dive deeper, then obviously those are, are those are the people that you want to be exploring, you know, sharing your feelings with. Um, those are the safe people who really, really care about you. Do most INFJs often feel left out, like they're on the outside looking in? I think a lot of us do. I think some of it comes from, you know, we like to spend time with other people. Some of it comes from, we don't really connect very well with a lot of people, especially people who are more self-centered, who more live on the surface of things, who are more interested in like trends and pop culture and things like that. I felt left out a lot when I was in grade school because I just didn't feel like I belonged there. I felt like I was a lot older than the people that I was with. I feel left out sometimes now when I'm at work because, you know, I talked about earlier that they have a lunch club and everybody, you know, they're all interested in the same TV shows and they have similar politics and, and they like to watch football and basketball and all that stuff. And a lot of them have kids too. And so they connect through sharing experiences about their kids and, and I don't have kids <laughs> and, and I don't have a boyfriend right now. So I don't even have that type of connection with people. Um, so I think, you know, it is easy to feel left out, but I also think about what it would take for me to be a part of their little club. And I know that that's not what I want in my life. And so I found other ways to feel connection with people. I found other people who share common interests as I do. Um, and that helps me to feel a little more connected. All right. I know that we didn't get through all of the questions. Um, I think we literally got through like half of the questions that I have. So I'm going to save the rest of the questions for another episode, um, which hopefully I'm going to be posting very soon. The questions that we didn't get through are more of um, about connection, about relationships, about finding your purpose and about being highly sensitive. So I'm going to figure out how to uh, maybe it'll be next week's episode. I'm not sure, but I will get to all of them soon. If you have a question, I would love to hear your question. You can submit it on my website, which is um, for the podcast. The website is thequietonespodcast.com. If you scroll down all the way to the bottom of the page, there is a um, contact form there. You can put your question in there and send it to me. Um, you can also send me your questions um, on my Instagram, which is INFJ woman, which is at INFJ woman. You can find me on my other website too, which is my blog. That is infjwoman.com. And I'll make sure to answer as many questions as I possibly can. I really appreciate every single one of you guys. Um, I love being able to help you. So I'm here to help in any way that I possibly can. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate every single one of you. Please make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already and leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast. It helps other people to be able to find us. Thanks again for listening and I will see you again next week. Hi there. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Please consider subscribing to my channel. I'm working very hard to produce content that will help you. And I really, really appreciate your support. Also, if you want some more inspiration, check out this video right here.